Hey everyone, this is Pastor Todd and Miss Daphne. We pastor Transformation Church here in Seminole, Texas. And I believe that this message is gonna be a blessing to you. Our vision is to transform lives and change the world. We wanna invite you to join us online or in person Sundays at 10.30 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. Are you ready for the Word today? Are you excited about the Word of God? Anybody awake? I want anybody alive and kicking today, ready to, to just get right into the Word of God today. Amen? Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse number 28. This whole year, we've been talking about purpose and our identity in Christ. Specifically, I want to take it a little bit deeper today. But here in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible says this, and we know that all things, somebody say all things. Not some things, not every once in a while, just hoping. No, all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, God's working it out. Come on, find some around and say, God's working it out. Do you believe that today? I've been saying this all year long. Do you still believe that God's working it out? Has it been tough at times? Yes, but can, walk, can God work it out? Absolutely. Has, has things not turned out like we thought they would? Sure, but guess what? God's still working it out. And I like this about God. God always saves the best for last. Didn't get a whole lot of amens on that. Didn't I mean, we believe God's saved, saving the best for last. And what I mean by that, the end of this year is going to be better than the first of this year. Amen. Thank you. The end of this year is going to be better than the first of this year. Amen. Now, you might have had a good year at the beginning of this year, but guess what? It's going to get better. I said it's going to get better. I said, it's going to get better. And I got Bible that says about it. And we know all things work together for the good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you love God, you can expect God to do even better at the end of this year. Come on, I'm expecting some great and mighty things to happen this month and next month. That's just going to launch us into 2024. I'd be all right if the Lord returns, but if he doesn't, how about just going into 2024, just like, like the old school says, guns blaring, just ready to rock and roll. Hallelujah. Go watch a John Wayne movie sometime. Google it. And they go out guns blaring. Amen. And what does that mean? That means you go out strong. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. We're going to finish this year strong, believing that God is working things for our good. Why? Because we love him and we're called according to his purpose. This year we've been talking about our identity, and our identity is who we are, and our purpose is what we do. Once you find out who you are, then it's easy to find out what to do. This is where a lot of Christians kind of miss it. They're too busy trying to figure out what to do instead of figuring out who they are. I've known a lot of people that that's work dead end jobs. They call it dead end jobs because it's just a job to to get the bills paid, and they have no joy in the job. Well, it's because they don't know really who they are. They're just trying to get the bills paid. But once you find a job that that fits your identity, fits who you are, you you don't work a day in your life. You just love going and doing it. Amen. Because it's who you are. If you like to to serve people, then get into serving business. Hallelujah. If you like to organize, get in an organizing business or whatever it is, because your identity is who God's called you to be, and your purpose is how you do it. Amen. We've been talking all year long about this. But I want to take it a little bit deeper. Look at this scripture again, verse number 28. And we know that all things work together for, for good to those who love God. Notice this. To those who are called. Somebody say called. Called according to his purpose. This word called, it means it's invited. It means divinely selected. It means appointed. So if we put this in context of the scripture, to those who are invited, those who are divinely selected, those who are appointed to his purpose. This tells me that his purpose is a choice. Come on, somebody. His purpose is a choice. We choose to accept his purpose for our life or we choose to do life for ourselves. But see, he's called us, invited us, divinely selected us, and appointed us for his purpose. But it's an invite. You can accept the invite or decline the invite. 
Now, let me help you here. If you're born again and you know you're going to heaven, thank God for that. And he will, his love never changes for you. He will always love you, regardless of what you do from now till the day you pass or the day the Lord returns. He will always love you. You can do nothing to change his love for you. He will always love you. But the fact still remains that if you follow after his purpose, that's what pleases him. There's a difference between knowing that God loves you and knowing that you're called with a purpose to please him. See, this is where the rubber meets the road. A lot of us, we can grab a hold of the fact that God loves us, absolutely. But can you ask yourself today, can you honestly ask yourself down in your heart of hearts, have you been pleasing to God? And if there's some areas that you have been pleasing, keep doing it. If there's some areas that you've missed it, step it up. Come on, high five somebody. Step it up. Then recognize the weakness in your life. Recognize that it hasn't been pleasing to God and change. And the moment that you make the decision to change and pursue God, you actually begin to fulfill his purpose for your life. Now I want to take this a little bit deeper. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, bless you, babe, that was three times, goodness gracious, with the, with the well, you just totally distra- distracted me with that blessed sneeze. To those who obtain like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, this is what I want to get to. Are you all with me? Verse number 3. As his divine power has given to us all things. Somebody say all things. Say it again. Say all things. That pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, when Peter was writing this letter, he was trying to get across several different things, but what I want to get across to you today is verse number three. As his divine power has given to us all things... Again, somebody say all things. Well, Paul had a revelation that all things work together for good. Peter had a revelation that all things have been given to us that pertain to life and what? Godliness. So everything that we have in life that we need to obtain success, to move forward, to do all that God's called us to do, has already been given to us by Jesus Christ. A lot of people are trying to search for it and try to get it. It's already been given to us. The Bible's clear about it. It has given to us all things. Now, how many know if you look at the word all, it means all? It means, it, means, it means everything you need in your life, God has already given it to you. And then we know that all things, those things, all things work out together for the good. So everything that you need in your life, you already have. If you need to be set free, you already got it. If you need deliverance, you already got it. If you're a believer, if you need a financial breakthrough, you already got it. Why? Because Jesus has already given you that. The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. Come on, if you need restoration in your relationships, you already got the power to see restoration in your, in your relationships. Come on, somebody. It's not a matter of hoping. It's not a matter of wishing. It's a matter of grabbing hold of what God's word has already said, already what he's already bought and paid for through Jesus Christ. All things work together for the good. All things that pertain to life and godliness has already been given to you by his power. How many believe in the power of God? Come on, anybody believe in the power of God in this place? It's the power of God that knocks sin out of your life. Come on, it's the power of God that knocked sin out of your life and called you to be a saint. It's the power of God that that redeemed you from the curse of the law, redeemed you from poverty, sickness, and life. It's the, it's, it's the power of God that saves you, delivers you, and sets you free. But not only that, it's the power of God that helps you live a godly life. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got the power. Come on, how fast away? You got the power. Oh, but you don't understand, preacher. It's so hard out there. It's so crazy out there. Absolutely. That's why you need to tap into that power. 
When God's wise enough to understand that you need help. That's why he said, I'm giving you everything you need that pertains to life and godliness by his power. Now check this out. We know in Romans chapter 8 verse 28, you don't have to turn back there, but we are called according to his purpose. But Peter had the same kind of revelation. Notice verse number 3 again. As his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Notice this. Who called us. Somebody say called us. Called us by glory and virtue. So there is a call. There is an invitation. There is a divine selection. There is an appointment that God's given each and every believer to obtain, to accept in order to live this life for him. Specifically, Peter had a deeper revelation about this call. He said that, we, that God has called us by what? By glory, his manifested presence, the heaviness of God, and virtue. Somebody say virtue. And this is what I want to talk about for the next several weeks. I want to talk about the virtue of God and how we're called to be a virtuous people. Now, I know that almost sounds like a feminine term, but it's not. It's a very, very manly term. So if, if you think of, well, I'm not going to be a virtuous woman, I'm a man. Well, yeah, you can be a virtuous man, and I'll show you. By definition, this word virtue, it means excellence. It actually means moral excellence. It means masculinity. Look to your neighbor and say, are you man enough? Now, some women are like, no, I'm not. I'm glad you said that because nowadays, anyways. I mean, for us to, to obtain this call, to accept this call, to receive this call, to receive this invitation from God, it's going to require all of us to man up, woman up. If you're a woman, woman up, man up. Y'all know what I mean. It's time for us to live an excellent life. That's what that word virtue means. It means excellence. It actually means this. We are divinely selected and appointed to live an excellent life. This is so important for Christians to know today. Excellence is defined as this, the quality of being outstanding or extremely good. Look to your neighbor and say, you're pretty outstanding. Put a smile on your face and say it like you really mean it. Say, you're pretty outstanding. Well, what makes us outstanding? It's not the hair that we have, it's not, or the lack of, it's not that, it's, it's not the clothes we wear, it's not how much money we make or not make, it's, it's not the kind of cars we drive or how big the house we are or anything like that. Though God wants us blessed, but that doesn't make us who we are. What makes us who we are is the quality of being outstanding. Now, specifically, when we're talking about virtue and excellence, it's talking about Christians standing out in a dark world. Where people can tell that you're a Christian just by the way you talk, by the way you walk, by your attitude at work, by your attitude at home. It's an excellent life, and it's a life that should shine bright in these dark days. Somebody say excellence. Now, again, excellence is something that we should always want to obtain and keep pursuing. It's that quality to be outstanding, extremely good. Now, turn over to Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. And again, I'm going to get where you live today. Is that all right? Well, I'm going to anyways. I hope this message challenges you today. I hope, I, you know, like we say here in Texas, I hope it steps all over your toes. I hope you, I hope you leave the service today going, oh, that hurts so good. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Just wait. This is the introduction. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Finally, brethren, or we can say this, finally, sisterin. Some of you guys will get that because it's talking about brothers. Anyways, finally, brother, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, somebody say virtue. If there be anything praiseworthy, what? Meditate on these things. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. If you're looking for peace in your life, meditate on how to be excellent. Think about that for a second. You know, again, Paul writing to the church at Philippi, he was telling them what to think about. How many know your battle is not with the person you're sitting next to? Come on, your battle's not your job place. Your battle's not your checkbook. Your battle's not your checking account. Your battle is your thoughts. 
And Paul was trying to get a church across to the church at Philippi by the Holy Ghost that whenever you think on things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of virtue, excellent things, and you meditate on these things, that's how you receive peace for your life. So many people think going on a vacation will bring them peace. Sure, it will for a moment. But how many know you got to go back to work? Amen. Or you, you better go back to work. You got be, Come on. Let me just help you about this. How many ever said, I need a vacation for my vacation? Hello, I've said that a couple times. Well, how many know vacation is a short-lived thing? It'll give you peace for a moment. But Paul, he was trying to say this to the church at Philippi, to these Christians, that you can live in peace by meditating on pure things, on true things, on just things, on, on things that are lovely, things that are of good report, things that are of excellence, doing things in an outstanding way. Now, before I go any further, I just want you to understand this. When it comes to talking about excellence, I'm not talking about works. I'm not talking about a religious thing. I'm talking about excellence is not a works mentality. It's a love reality. You're not trying to to get God to do something for you. No, you're doing something for him because you love him. You want to approve things in your life because you love him. My marriage after 30, you know, 32 years, going on 33 years of being married, if I didn't just sit around and just tell Daphne I love her and not have any corresponding action, let me tell you, these 30 years would be rough. Come on, somebody. How many, how many married people know what I'm talking about up in here? Come on, you got to have some love in that relationship. It's more than just having kids, if you know what I mean. It's more than just being roommates and paying the bills. If you want your marriage to grow, you got to put some love in it. you got to put some action in it. Well, it's the same way with your relationship with God. It's, it's got to put action in your relationship with God to keep improving. You keep moving forward in your relationship with God. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Come on. You keep moving forward. You keep stretching out in faith and believe God that he's changing you from the inside out. Don't be satisfied with your walk with God. It can always get better. Come on, somebody. I said it can always get better. God is going to make sure if you, if you just tap into his love, he'll make sure that you'll grow. He'll make sure that you'll move forward. In your, you won't be dealing with the same things you're dealing now this time next year. And what's even more important than that, the things that you're dealing now, your kids won't ever have to deal with it. Come on, somebody. That's what's most important. Thank God that we can get to a place to where we live an excellent life, to where we're not looking at our kids and they're going through the same thing we went through. There's got to be a shift that takes place in our families. And that shift is just certain, just meditating on virtuous things, meditating on the excellence of God. Come on, I've always said this for years. Look to your neighbor and say, I know you need to change. Come on, high five someone and say, I know you need to change. Y'all need to be reminded that all the time, I'm just saying. See, a lifestyle of excellence starts with meditating on excellence, excellent things. Now, let me help you here today when it comes to meditating on things. I want you to know that we serve an excellent God. We serve an outstanding God. He does exceedingly abundantly above all that we ever ask or think. In fact, his name is excellence. In Psalms chapter 8, verse number 1, O Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set, you, who have set your glory above the heavens. His name is excellence. And the reason why his name is excellence is because he's Elohim. God is our creator. He's Abba Father. He's our Father God. He's El Shaddai. He's Almighty. He's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. He's Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. He's Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is our banner or our victory. The Lord is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord is our, our Araha, is our shepherd. The Jehovah Tiskanu, the Lord our righteousness. And Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is here. He's Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Everything that's in his name is excellent, is outstanding. We serve an excellent God, an outstanding God. And God's greatness reveals his excellence. Turn to Psalms chapter 145, verse number 3. Y'all still with me today? Psalm 145, verse 3. The Bible says, as great is the Lord 
and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Think about that for a second. His greatness is unsearchable. See, God is not just merely great. His greatness can't even be measured. Let me say that again. He's not just merely great. You can't even measure his greatness. Why? Because he's an excellent God. He's outstanding. Because of his greatness, his excellence transcends our limited understanding. I mean, know some knuckleheads. Don't look to your neighbor. I know some of you are like, I've married one. You kidding me? I know he's a knucklehead. I've been trying to raise him for something. No. We all got some knuckleheads in our lives. And that's just proof that we need a God. Some of us have made a lot of mistakes. Some of us are, are being bombarded by all kinds of stressful things. That's why you need God. And we need his greatness. We need to allow him to reveal his excellence in our lives because he's not just merely great. His greatness can't even be measured. And when we experience his greatness, man, when we experience his greatness, it really reveals how limited we are. I can think of many times, and I know you probably can too, I can think of many times in my life that I, had, I thought I had it all figured out, and then God showed up. And I realized, wow, I don't got it all figured out. And then I sit back and I'm like, I thank God you're God. And I thank God I'm not. Because that's when God shows up with his greatness. And it just blows our mind. It's just we can't even understand how truly great he is. Turn over to Romans chapter 11, verse number 33. I'm helping you understand. I want you to meditate on excellent things. Romans chapter 11, look at verse number 33 says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who, first give, who, or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. You must understand this. God is excellent, and his excellence is manifested in his wisdom. Aren't you thankful that he's a wise God? All the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So many times, like I said, we try to figure it out ourselves. We try to handle it ourselves, but we should just stop and ask God, who has unlimited amounts of wisdom. And and I've always said this, and I believe this about God. God's not confined by time. He created time. And what makes him a wise God is that he already knows the future. He's already been in the future. He already knows the mistakes that you're about to make. And what makes him wise is that he can stop you from making those mistakes because he's already been in your future. Oh, come on. You know, now, now I'm preaching real good. Now it's whenever you, you have to stop and say, oh, hold up. If, God, you've got a plan for my life and you have a purpose for my life, you've already been in my future, then I need to stop myself and start, like, asking you for some help. Like getting you involved in my relationships, getting you more involved in my prayer life, getting you more involved in my finances. Because if you already know I'm about to make a mistake, hello, I want you to help me not make that mistake. That's wisdom. Here's another thing about God's excellence. God's excellence cannot be separated from his holiness. Let me say that again. God's excellence, him being outstanding, cannot be separated from his holiness. Exodus chapter 15 verse 11 says this. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? See, in all actuality, God's glory is his excellence. God's glory is his excellence. And his excellence can't be separated from his holiness. He's a holy God. He doesn't make mistakes. He's never made one. He never will make one. He is God. He is holy. And his holiness goes with him wherever he's at. Aren't you glad that he's a merciful God? Aren't you glad that he, he, he shows mercy to us on a daily basis because of his holiness? Aren't you thankful for Jesus that died on the cross and intercedes for us on a daily basis? But that doesn't change God's holiness. 
And his excellence is revealed through his glory and through his holiness. Now I'm about to blow you away. Y'all ready to get blown away? Now we know God is an excellent God. Amen. Now turn over to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 48. As you're turning there, look to your neighbor and say, get ready. Come on, find somebody and say, get ready. Jesus is amazing. How many know Jesus is amazing? And Jesus can't lie. And when Jesus gives an instruction, let me know that instruction is for us to follow. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Y'all ready for this? Therefore, you should be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, I know that a lot of you might be sitting here and say, it's impossible to be perfect, and you are right. But if you look up this word perfect, it means complete maturity and growth. What Jesus was saying here is that as God is excellence and he set the bar for excellence, we as his believers, as his followers, we should follow after that standard of excellence. In fact, our maturity and our growth is all measured by our pursuit of being better. Hallelujah. Now everybody getting real quiet because I know it's almost lunchtime. But think about this for a second. Your real growth, your maturity is measured by not how well you sing in service, not by how well you lift your hands, not how how well you shout during service or how many scriptures you read on a weekly basis. Real true um, um, measurement of maturity is are you changing, are you growing spiritually? And what what are we doing as believers to make sure that we're excelling in our growth in God? Now, I know a lot of people are just trying to keep their nose above the water. They're just trying to keep their, because the devil's got them under attack, and they got all this going on, and my life's so busy. I got kids. I, I, hello, all of us have got something that we can use for excuses not to grow spiritually. But when Jesus says, and it's a command, therefore you shall be perfect, or you shall be mature, you shall grow just as your Father in heaven is mature. He sets the standard of excellence. We as believers, we should evaluate our lives as we're coming to the end of this year. Have you grown spiritually this year? Go on, ask yourself that. Have you grown spiritually this year? Are you where you're at in January right now? You don't understand what I mean by that. Have you grown any? Have you gone through battles? Yes. Has it been difficult this year? Yes, all of us can say that. But have you grown from it? Come on, somebody. Are you... I know I'm, not expect, I'm expecting you to say amen, but I want you to think about this. Are you growing spiritually? Because excellence is a part of who God is, and, and he wants us to grow spiritually. He doesn't want us to stay the same. And see, our purpose in life is to pursue godliness. Now look at your neighbor and say, I know you ain't God. I want you to say, I know you ain't God. But there's a difference between God and godliness. Godliness means a reverence and respect for the things of God. And we show reverence and respect for God by our pursuit of God. I'll say that again. We show reverence and respect for God by our pursuit of God. I'll say it again. We show reverence and respect for God by our pursuit of God. And God is excellence, and we reverence and respect God by living a life of excellence. By living a life that's above mediocrity, that's above the norm, that's in pursuit of getting better. Not in a religious way, not in a works mentality, but because we love him. Because we love what he's done for us and what he's doing for us. I want to improve my relationship with God, not because of any other thing, but simply because I love him. That's why I want to improve my marriage all the time, because I love my wife. She wants the same thing, praise the Lord. That's half the battle when you... When both of y'all want to get better. Amen. It's the same way with your relationship with God. God wants you to get better. He needs you to get better. We all need to get better. We're not at a place of complete perfection. We've got to grow in this area. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1, you can turn there as I begin to close. You guys know that means nothing. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul, again, writing... This letter to Timothy, his dear son in the faith, and he was writing this by the Holy Spirit. He said this, therefore I exhort, exhort first of all, the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. How many know we should be praying for everyone? 
Let me say this. We should be praying for our president. Can I get a better amen than that? I mean, there's a lot of reasons why y'all know what I mean. But we, the Bible says that we should be praying for him. Amen. Whether you agree with him or not, we should be praying for him. Man, a holy hush is this, this holy place. We should be praying for our president. In fact, let's do that right now. I just feel that we should pray for him. So bow your heads. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, your word says to pray for those that are in authority. So we as a church, we pray for President Biden right now in the name of Jesus, that you would open up his eyes, that you would give him supernatural wisdom to conduct the righteous thing to do in our country. Holy Spirit, I ask that you invade the White House in Jesus' name, that you begin to change things there, that you begin to improve things there in the name of Jesus. The effective, fervent prayer of righteous people avails much, so we lift up our president in the name of Jesus, and we declare that there will be supernatural things happen to change and rearrange and cause the country to go according to righteousness, even more than it already is, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, being doers of the word. Now, that doesn't mean we're closing service. I got some more to preach on. Verse number two. For kings and all those that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life. Notice this. In all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants us to live a godly life. In fact, as we pray, we're we're connecting with God, and prayer actually opens up the door for us to get revelation on how to live in godliness. In fact, you're there in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Jump down to chapter number 4, verse number 6. Again, I said this, but Paul, he's writing to a young pastor. He was in fact, Timothy was a pastor at the church at Ephesus. And he said this, if you instruct the brethren, he's talking to a pastor there. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished, uh, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wise fables. Exercise yourself in what? Godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but thank God it does profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. My responsibility as a pastor is to preach on godliness, to live a godly life, to live an excellent life. It's more than patty cake, patty cake, God is good, see you guys on Wednesday. Amen. It's more than a feel good where you get goosebumps messages. We have those, but I mean, you can't live off of icing on a cake all the time. Come on, you got you got to get to where you can cut your own steak and eat it. Mm-hmm. I bet the organ playing on that one. Ah, preacher, preach on that one. Because I'm giving you guys some T-bones today, and you got to get your fork and knife out because I'm not going to spoon feed steak to you. I want you to grow. I want us all to grow in more godliness. And why? Because I fear God. I have a, a godly respect for God. I'm going to have to stand before God for what I say behind this pulpit. And if, and if I stand before God and, and God's like, why didn't you preach more on being godly? I have to answer for that. Not y'all. I have to. But now I'm good because I'm going to be preaching on godliness. Hallelujah. Now what you do with this between you and God? Praise God. Now, look at verse number 4, or chapter 4, verse 6. If you instruct the brother in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus, nurtured in the words of faith and doing and of good doctrine which you have carefully followed, but reject profane and old wise fables. In other words, forget about all the rumors. Come on, somebody. And exercise yourself in godliness. So it's my responsibility as a pastor to teach so we can learn how to exercise ourselves in godliness. Now, you're there, you were there in Peter. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. Are y'all still with me today? Y'all getting all quiet on me. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and what? And what? And godliness. Not only are we called to live godliness, but he's empowered us to live a godly lifestyle in godliness. Now, again, we're not going to be God. 
but we're to live a godly life. Verse 4, by which you have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we are going to learn how to live a godly life. Second Peter chapter 1, again, it's so important that we focus on his power has been given to us. That's how we can live a godly lifestyle. It's not works by any means. It's because we love him. And he's empowered us to live that way. How many here can honestly say, I love Jesus with everything I have. I love him so much. Then it's, this message should drive you to want to do better. Come on, somebody. If you truly, if we really truly love God, it should drive us. There should be actions, corresponding action to the fact that I love him, but I want to, I want to, I want more of him. I want to pursue him with everything that I have. It's it's my life now. I've given up my old life. I want to live for him. Maturity is measured by how well we apply pressure to our weaknesses. Listen, listen, listen. Maturity is measured by how well we apply pressure to our weaknesses. The question I want to ask you today is simply this. Are you under pressure or are you putting pressure? Come on, good answer. You get an A. You get a smiley face today, bro. You're welcome. (laughs) So ask yourself that question. Are you under pressure or are you putting pressure? Because... We all have to evaluate that in our lives. Paul, he said this in Philippians chapter 3, not that I've obtained, already obtained or am already perfected, but I, what? Press on. I'm not under pressure. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press. Somebody say, I press. Say, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on. Verse 15. A lot of people forget verse 15. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have what? This in mind. If anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. See, a lot of us want to quote that, I press towards the goal of the prize of what we're calling Christ Jesus. Praise God. But then there's the therefore. What's it there for? Because it's how we measure maturity. Therefore, let us as our mature. So the simple question again was, are you under pressure? Or are you putting the pressure on? We're going to put the pressure on. What, is it, what does that mean, put the pressure on? If there's some weak things in my life, it's time to change. If there's some things in my life that need to change, I I want to put the pressure on it and change. If if you're slacking and you're reading the Bible, put the pressure on. Get back and read your word. If you slack some time and come into church, put some pressure on. Come back to church faithfully. If it's financially, you've, you've not been given like you should be given, put some pressure on. The reason why you got pressure financially is because you might have stopped giving. The scripture simply says if you give it, it'll be given back to you multiplied. So put some pressure on. Come on, high five somebody say, put some pressure on. Come on. High five somebody say, put the pressure on. Let's not be under pressure. Let's put some pressure on some situations. Come on, if you got got sickness in your body, put put the word on it. Put some pressure on it. Come on, if your marriage isn't where it needs to be, put some pressure on it. Put God's word on it. Put some prayer on it. Come on, somebody. Put some love in it. Amen. If you got some relationship problems outside of your marriage, put some love into it. Put some pressure on it. Don't lay awake at night stressed out about what's going to happen. Put some, put some word on it. Put some pressure on it. Am I helping anybody today? Come on, somebody. It's time to put some pressure on. I press towards the goal. I'm not under pressure under the goal. The goal is just so hard. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm alive. Now put some pressure on it. Whining is not going to change the pressure. Complaining about your situation is not going to change the pressure. What changes the pressure is when you stop whining and griping about it and put the Word of God on it. 
Put some prayer on it. Find somebody to come in agreement with you on it. And say, hey, I need some help. I need you to come in agreement with me. Let's pray about this financial situation. Let's pray about my relationship. Let's pray about this. Let's come in agreement and watch God do something. Watch him just move. Come on, high five somebody and say, put some pressure on it. Come on, high five somebody and say, put some pressure on it. I mean, look him straight in the eye and say, put some pressure on it. Put some pressure on it. I just saw this picture when I said this, and this is how God shows me things. Don't think I'm weird, but this is how he shows me things. How many has ever packed on a sandwich with a lot of stuff? You got, you got ham, cheese, then you got ham again, you got some cheese, you got some ham, put some cheese. And then the wife walks up, you need to put some lettuce on that, okay. Put some lettuce on it, then pack some more ham on it. I mean, it gets so big you can't get it in your mouth. I mean, you know what I mean. I don't know, some of y'all got big mouths. No, anyways. So, what do you do? You press it down. You press it down. Have you ever tried to eat something that is not pressed down? It gets all over you. When you put the pressure, when you put the pressure on it, you can eat it. But if you can't put pressure on, it's just going to get all over you. Hello, somebody. You catching what I'm saying? When you put pressure on, you can enjoy that, that quadruple ham sandwich. Man, it's getting lunchtime. I better stop myself right now. But if you don't press on it, it's just going to get all over you and fall out on the plate. And you get frustrated and throw it in the trash and get something else to eat. I mean, that's where a lot of Christians are at. They're not putting pressure on their situation. And life is getting all over you. Life is just squeezing out all over you. Put some pressure on it, and then you can eat. You can take life by the horns. You can you can eat life. Amen. It doesn't bother you anymore. Come on, come on. Look at your neighbor. And say, it looks like you need to put some pressure on your sandwich. Everybody's gonna go home and eat ham sandwiches now. But in all seriousness, come on. You're not designed by God to live a pressured life. You, you're not. God did not call you to live a pressured life. He's called us all. He's given us his authority, his power, all things that pertain to life and godliness to put pressure on those things that pressure us. Come on, it's our turn now to fight back. Come on, somebody said it's our turn now to fight back. Come on, you're a royal priest to the holy nation called by God himself to live a godly life. Let's do it. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, just do it. Woo! Come on, bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this message today. We're going to live an excellent life, a life of virtue according to your standard, Lord. Lord, we're going to put pressure on our situations. We're not going to live under the pressure but we're going to put pressure on our situation. We're going to start declaring your word. We're, start, we're going to start coming in agreement with your word, that your word is alive. It's a two-edged sword. It changes things. Lord, and our praise is a, is a mighty weapon. It's what causes the walls to come down. So we choose to put the word on it, and put some worship on it, and see our lives changed. Thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in our church. Thank you, Lord, for all that's going to happen in 2024. Oh, but the rest of this year, Lord, we're not done yet. The best is yet to come this year. Hallelujah. I hear, I hear that, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As you apply my word in these days, as you do my word and follow my instructions, in these last couple months. You'll see my glory and you'll see my provision and it will come and it will be overwhelming because all I'm looking for is obedience. All I'm looking for is a willing heart to say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. In Jesus' name.